Thank you and welcome to today's uh, eBay research seminar uh, where we're going to talk about the geopolitics of EU migration uh, instruments. And today's speaker, let me introduce uh, you to her, uh, is Federica Sardo, a former doctoral student of mine that is doing so well. Uh, she is currently based at the University of Vienna, as far as I know. And uh, she's been working on migration studies uh, uh, during her PhD, but also I think more predominantly now after in the postdoc uh, period. So she's quite an expert at this uh, stage uh, in, in terms of everything that goes on in EU mobility as well as uh, migration uh, policy. So um, we are very much looking forward to your presentation today, uh, Federica. This will also t uh, be a, a shared event with uh, the Visions Project, which is a, a project that is um, uh, devoted to geopolitics uh, in the EU neighborhood. So if any of you are interested, you can enter into our webpage, projectvisionsaltogether.info. Uh, um, so without further ado, Federica, you have some PowerPoint or something that you would like to share with us. And then um, you have about, uh, I, I uh, assume about 30 minutes if you uh, would like to. And then after that, we'll do some Q&A. Perfect. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much, Elizabeth, and thank you very much, um, in Basel and Barcelona Institute for International Studies, for inviting me in this not our new normal format, <laughs> unfortunately. But I'm really glad to be here to present um, part of my work uh, and well, discuss with you a topic that I believe deserves uh, attention. Um, I also join Elizabeth uh, by um, thanking the Visions Project uh, help, uh, at eBay because it supported an important part of, of this research. So uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for, for involving me in this in this project. Um, so the focus of, of today's webinar will be on the U Trust Fund for Africa, which is one of the financial instruments established by the European Union to govern um, migration. Um, so, why do I focus on, on policy instruments and uh, in particular on financial instruments rather than on um, EU policies, so rather than on the policy level? So, a part, partial answer to, uh, to my question can be drawn up from the, the following picture, uh, which compares EU funds for migration on the three multi-annual financial frameworks, from, so from the um, MFF from 2007 to 2013 uh, until the latest one uh, recently approved, covering 2021 to uh, 2027. Um, so here I compare the funding allocated by the European Union to the management of, uh, so to the policies related to migration and, and asylum. Um, and one should be uh, aware that the total that I indicated and then I will discuss later on only includes those funding instruments that have a direct, uh, a direct link to migration and does not include those funds wherein migration is a crop cutting issue um, and the budgetary lines, the budgetary heading cannot be clearly uh, identified. So for comparative purposes, uh, I, I decided to, to, uh, to choose those funding uh, where migration is directly um, mentioned and, and present. So for example, I did not take into account uh, the European uh, Neighborhood and Partnership Instruments, although there is a, well, the, the relevance of migration in NPI is, is, is important, uh, but with some exceptions, it's not that easy to identify as those projects that are uh, mainly targeting uh, or exclusively targeting migration, especially from a budgetary perspective. Um, so the first interesting information um, that one can draw out of uh, uh, from the following picture is the, the stark increase in the total uh, allocation um, for migration, raising from 5 billion euros under the multi-annual financial framework 2007 to 2013 uh, to 30 billion euros under the current um, uh, multi-annual financial framework, where also a whole budgetary heating uh, has, be, has been created to address specifically uh, migration and border management, so the new heating four of the EU budget, which is actually called uh, migration and border management. 
Um, the second uh, information from this uh, comparative picture is that the funds through which the total amount is allocated um, vary significantly. So over time, some funds have disappeared, um, some have been grouped together, uh, some new funds have been created, um, and changes also apply and involve implementation rules within the funds themselves. Um, so a first empirical look at those changes show that these changes are not only nominal, are not only symbolic, uh, and might say something uh, about the policy level, um, about what is happening uh, at the level of the EU migration uh, policy or policies. Um, this dynamic picture at the level of instruments um, is particularly puzzling if we compare that to a policy process which, which is on the other hand quite stalemated. So uh, there have been limited reforms um, and we, we can clearly see a stalemate in terms of reform uh, at, the, at the policy level. So, in light of this, what does this dynamism at the level of funding instrument uh, tell us about the development of the EU migration policy? So, of course, uh, answering this question requires a bigger research, which is actually what I'm currently conducting, um, both at the University of Vienna and at uh, then at the University uh, Krems. Um, but what I would like to address today is what do EU funds for migration tell us about the EU migration policy from a geopolitical perspective? So, to what extent do migration, funding for migration, mirror changing geopolitical interests? Um, and uh, to what extent do they represent change, if changing, if any, uh, representations of the EU African geopolitical space? And what is their geopolitical input? So uh, what impact do they have when they are implemented on the ground, but also uh, when they are designed by, by policy makers? And to do that, um, I will focus on the EU Trust Fund for uh, Africa. Um, the EU Trust Fund for Africa was a key response, uh, the key European Union response to the migration crisis uh, in, in 2015. Um, it was launched in the, after the summit in, in La Valletta in 2015 uh, and it was the first instrument addressing the external dimension uh, of, of migration as a, as a, as a, as a whole instrument. Um, uh, it, has, it involves 4.8 billion euros coming from um, EU, um, uh, EU funding, uh, already existing EU funding and member states' contributions, um, and involves, and it's, it's divided into three geographic uh, windows. So uh, the, the geographic window north of Africa, then the Sahel and Lake Chad, and the Horn of Africa. Um, so far, it has funded 254 projects or programs, uh, and it's supposed to expire by the end of, uh, of, this, of this year, so no more projects will be funded, but, but there has been an extension in order for the uh, signed contract to, uh, to be implemented and to be concluded. So um, there will be no more uh, trust fund as we know it for the moment after 2021, but as the website of the European Commission uh, of the Trust Fund says, there will, well, the programs and projects initiated under the Trust Fund uh, will be capitalized into the already existing funding and into the existing um, or ongoing uh, programs that are, um, um, are now being now programmed and designed uh, when we are uh, at this very same moment. And this will have an impact uh, in terms of findings that I will show here uh, today. So um, what I did in order to, uh, to understand what was the geopolitical impact of the trust fund was to analyze 200 out of the 245 uh, projects funded by the trust fund. I had to stop at certain point, so I'm missing 45 uh, projects that I'm now um, trying to, to recollect and recover. Um, but the majority has been analyzed. 
um, I analyzed how the projects work. I tried to trace the, the design of the, of the trust fund and the, um, the governance mechanism uh, from the design of the projects to the implementation. And I try to especially look at um, the, well, what are the implementing partners of those projects and where are uh, these projects located depending on the implementing partner of the project. Um, the Utrust Fund for Africa is especially, is particularly interesting also because it has a flexible governance uh, and management rules. Um, different from other, um, other funding tools uh, of the European Union uh, on, in, on migration, but also uh, more generally speaking, because uh, it involves a, a board governing the fund, which is called the Operational Committee, uh, which is made of representatives of the European Commission and the Member States, whose voting right uh, depends on the amount pledged um, then the project selection, the programming and the management phases do not follow, follow the standard EU procedures and are weakly regulated in search for this flexibility um, to, respond to, to respond to crisis. And moreover, the, the European Parliament has very limited oversight uh, of the UTF activities and we will see that this has an input on, um, on the, well, this has a clear input on the development and implementation of the, of the trust fund. So what I observe, um, and so my, fund, my findings can be grouped into, into three um, major findings. Uh, one um, group of findings has to do with the regional impacts of the U Trust Fund, um, where I realized and, and, and showed that uh, the, the U Trust Fund has affected power relations between geopolitical regions, and with that I refer to the Sahel region, the north of Africa, and the horn of Africa, and the European Union. So both between the European and in any of those regions, but also between um, among these regions themselves. Then a second impact, which I called a local impact, um, meaning that the U Trust Fund has affected the geographies of power among African states, um, creating uh, what can be called U Trust Fund winners and losers. I will go back to that uh, later, but. Um, it's definitely polarized um, the power relations among African states and between these African states and the European Union. Uh, and this is covered by what I call the bilateral input of the U-Trust Fund. So this polarization uh, of the power positionings of the EU member states uh, across the African continent according to uh, the respective geopolitical um, interests. So let's, let's have a look first at the regional uh, impact of the, of the U Trust Fund. So one of the uh, impacts of the, of the Trust Fund uh, at a regional level is that it consolidated and to some extent formalized the relevance of the Sahel region in EU Africa relations. So Sahel is even more, if we look at the way how uh, the Sahel region is described throughout the UTF documents and the project documents, um, and the way how it is uh, treated in the, in the projects, uh, we can clearly see that the Sahel region is increasingly a cornerstone of EU African uh, relations. Uh, this is not new, uh, it, is a, it, it is a long uh, process, but the UTF, I believe, has consolidated and to some extent formalized this centrality. Um, so if we look at uh, the, the investments uh, across uh, thematic dimensions, um, so the, the UTRUST Fund has four thematic dimensions, one related to employment opportunity and uh, economic development, one which is called improved governance and conflict prevention, one which is migration management, which is, has more to do with, uh, with, with controlling migration, uh, and one which is strength, strengthening resilience. 
So if we look at how the, project, the projects are uh, distributed uh, in the Sahel and Lake Chad um, and in the Horn of Africa, there is a balanced investment across dimension in this respect. But all through the UTF documents and several project documents, definitely the Sahel is depicted as a pivotal partner for the European Union. And I would like to have you to have a look at those uh, maps that uh, raised my attention. Um, so here you can see the representation of the Sahel and Lake Chad region uh, under the Utrust Fund and the representation of the Sahel um, region under the U Sahel strategy of 2011. Um, here you can definitely see that the Sahel as a space of migration delineated by the Utrust Fund is definitely wider than the Sahel as a space of security outlined in 2011 Sahel strategy, which includes only Mauritania, um, Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso and Chad. Um, and its borders are determined by migration routes. At the same time, the, um, the Sahel region uh, described and determined by the EU development policy um, is wider, the broader area, including countries such as, for example, Togo, which um, I argue, uh, as a result of my research, are becoming the EU trust fund forgotten. I will, I will go back to that later on. Uh, so what comes out of, of this analysis is that there is no unambiguous definition of the Sahel region and this is important because each of these represented spaces of course involves different actors and different power dynamics and whenever a new space is, is created there are in inclusionary and exclusionary dynamics that are uh, at play that deserves um, deserve attention. Um, a second regional input uh, that I would like to, uh, that I observe, uh, is at the level of the so-called southern neighborhood. Um, so the southern neighborhood, as uh, depicted by the European neighborhood, neighborhood policy, uh, as we knew it uh, under the level southern neighborhood, um, seems to fade away uh, to some extent with overlapping power dynamics um, at play. Um, meaning that on the one hand, the borders of the southern neighborhood seems to be pushed south towards the, the, what have been, has already been described in the past as southernmost neighborhood. Um, because, for example, neither in the Utrust Fund documents nor in the project documents there is reference to the southern neighborhood, but rather to the north of Africa as part of the African continent. Um, so this could suggest an expansion of the, of the, of the southern neighborhood as a geopolitical region, um, which is not, however, supported by an increased uh, cross-regional cooperation. So cooperation between um, the north of African region and the Sahel region, for example. Um, because uh, the, so the, the trust fund involves cross-window projects, so cross-regional projects, but if we have a look at the contents of those projects, they either involve general activities, so research and management, or they have a clear focus only on border control. And this has to do with the fact that the north of Africa, as a geographic window, uh, is only covered by the thematic dimension improved migration governance. Um, and this really consolidates this space as a space of transit, creating an inclusionary um, or exclusionary dynamics depending on different uh, positions uh, along the migration uh, routes. Uh, so this is really freezing this, uh, the, the, the southern neighborhood as, a, as an era of transit. Um, and uh, one can really see the extent to which the Libyan situation has driven the process of crisisification, if you want to uh, call it like that, of the whole region in order for that window to fall and to fit the EU trust fund as an emergency mechanism. So while there, there is a suggested expansion of the borders of the southern neighborhood as a geopolitical space, um, this is not supported by comprehensive cross-regional projects. 
uh, with a caveat, I have to admit, because most recently funded projects, um, which are cross-window, so regional programs, have been approved uh, and um, I had no time to analyze them carefully, but they seem to uh, have a, um, an approach that goes beyond the limited uh, thematic dimension, improved migration management, although formally the north of Africa is only targeted by that uh, thematic dimension. And then the third um, result concerning the regional input uh, involves, of course, the, the third uh, geographic window, so the Horn of Africa, um, which is depicted uh, at the Utrecht Fund level uh, as a space of overlapping crisis. Um, requiring regional approaches. And here you can definitely see, if you look at the implementing partners of the Utrust Fund projects in the Horn of Africa, the presence of African regional actors is far more important than compared to the other two geographic windows. Um, and there is a more, there seems to be a more comprehensive approach. Um, although the fact that this, this area keeps on being described and framed as an area of crisis upholds the use of emergency approaches um, rather than long-term strategies. So if this representation remains the same also during the current and the future design of other programs such as new development programs, and, but also migration-related programs, it might affect the, the capacity of the European Union to deliver forward-looking um, policy uh, outputs. So, um, going beyond the regional impact, um, the, what I describe as a local impact um, has to do with the capacity of the Utrust Fund to affect the balance of power between uh, African uh, countries, individual African countries, but also uh, between territories within the same countries. So um, the fact that, the, that, that migration routes drive policy making uh, creates or rather consolidates sort of cartographic threats that become dangerous if these threats underpin the EU external action beyond uh, the U.S. relation action beyond migration itself. So, for instance, uh, the development policy. Um, so, one can see, for example, that the most funded projects uh, are in, uh, so the most funded uh, countries uh, under the UTF are, for example, Somalia, Libya, Niger, Ethiopia, Mauritania, which are becoming really pivotal uh, to the EU geopolitics. Uh, while Cameroon and Tanzania, which are uh, important from a development perspective, are losing their centrality and this depends on their role and position along the migration route and depends on the geopolitical interests of the, of the EU member states. Um, a report of uh, 2017 uh, by the Concord Network, so a confederation of development NGOs, already pointed to the risk of ODAs um, uh, being diverted to migration uh, related projects. And this alert had, had been taken uh, up uh, by, uh, by the European Parliament. Um, even, even if this diversion does not, does not happen, um, what has to be carefully observed, I believe, is that like uh, one of the interviewees that I interviewed mentioned to me, this approach uh, does not create, risks creating a list of forgotten areas and countries. So not only forgotten countries, but also forgotten areas within the African countries themselves. Like for example, uh, Togo, like small Libyan municipalities, like the Lake Chad Basin uh, in, in Niger, which are neither important sources of origin or transit, nor are they important uh, from a geopolitical perspective for some for the EU member states. Um, and this is particularly important in light of the fact that the programs, uh, as, as communicated officially, and here I quote um, in the UN, UTF website by the Commission, the programs identified under the UTF for Africa shall feed into the future and ongoing joint programming of Commission services, external action service, member states, and recipient countries. So while the process of well, the geopolitical interest is, is common to many other funding tools. The half intergovernmental governance structure of the UTF is playing an important role in this process. 
in allowing the, the EU member states to, to position themselves themselves in those countries which have uh, which with which they have historical linkages and strong relations. Um, and this is clearly visible under what I call the impacts of the EU Trust Fund on bilateral relations. Um, because if we look at those maps um, here, so a closer look at, at, those, at the geographic location of the projects and the implementing partners involved uh, in the management of those projects, clearly shows how the polarization of EU African uh, geopolitical relation is, is taking place according to the EU member states' interests and the legacies of the, of the past, the historical legacies. So one can clearly see how, for example, France is clearly positioned and is strengthening its, its positioning in the Sahel region, uh, while, for example, Italy is, uh, well, is, 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 becoming, is becoming an uh, a, the key actor in, in Libya, but also in the Horn um, of Africa, for example. Or if we move to uh, Belgium, the same, uh, the same reasoning applies. So uh, Belgium is consolidating its position in some of the countries uh, in the Sahel, where it has historical uh, linkages and experience. Um, the only partner, the, the only country which is an exception in this respect is Germany. Uh, and apparently, uh, following the interviews that I, I conducted here, the experience of GEZ as an implementing partner is playing a role to uh, support the, the positioning of Germany across uh, across windows, so in all the geographic windows in this in this respect. Um, the governance structure, so the half intergovernmental uh, governance structure of the new trust fund is playing an important role here because for example the fact that the voting rights uh, depend on the amount uh, pledged for example is uh, allowing this uh, is making this power positioning uh, possible and um, a final point that I would like to raise is more to do with the um, theoretical implications of, uh, of the analysis of the U-Trust Fund. Um, because what I, what I realized after conducting this research is definitely that, uh, well, a focus on the level of uh, policy instruments and only, not only of, of policies definitely allows addressing some dimensions of, of the EU migration policy or as, as a public policy that would not uh, be, be visible otherwise. Um, so as the U-Trust Fund case really shows, those instruments are not neutral devices but are powerful institutions that, can, that are privileging uh, certain actors and certain interests and, other, and excluding others. Uh, and they, they can also drive forward a certain representations of, of the geopolitical space and of uh, political problems, so migration in this, in this respect. Um, so together with the policies, the financial instruments may definitely signal the pace and the direction of the EU, uh, of the EU activity and be a proxy for the salience of a particular, particular issue uh, for decision makers. So that's why I, I decided to focus the, uh, my, my, my research in this, in this space on, the, on, that, on that level to see as a, as a next step to what extent there is a, so how instruments now are impacting on the, on the, policy, on the policy level. So this is uh, the, the next step of my, of my research and how those changes at the level of instruments um, have affected the policy level, if, um, if any, of course. So um, I stop here and I, uh, I hope, yeah, I think I kept uh, the time. Um, I thank you very much and I'm looking forward to, to the discussion and the question. Thank you very much, Federica. It was a super interesting uh, talk that you gave to us. So we will be very happy to engage with you. Since this is a published piece already, I'm going to sort of default on my role as a discussant and just ask you some simple questions. But I thought, Mm, listen, why abuse of my turn as the moderator as well? So I will open up the floor first for anyone else who would like to ask you a question or make a comment um, that uh, you might find uh, interesting to engage with. And then we'll wrap up the session with uh, some of my comments, I think. 
So if any one of you would like to um, ask Federica a question, please raise uh, your hand with a hand raise uh, function that you have at the bottom of your screen together with your microphone and camera. And don't forget to open the microphone, which is a consistent <laughs> problem. And if you would like to open your camera as well, it would be so nice to see uh, your friendly faces. So anyone who would like to ask a question at this point? Adia? OK, so thank you very much, Federica, for the for the presentation, it was super interesting, and I think it's a it's a topic that it has so many um, that it touches upon so many important issues that I, I was like super concentrated all the time because it's it's fascinating, I think. And I, I had a kind of a specific question um, when when you presented this table with all the countries where you put uh, the money that each country received, I was shocked to see that. Libya was at the very top of the table, receiving 281 million euros. And Tunisia, which is the neighboring country too, was receiving only uh, 11 million. And both countries are super important for the European Union in terms of um, migration and mobility policies. Uh, so I was wondering, um, with the Utrecht Fund is some kind of um, division of labor uh, in the sense that the Utrecht Fund, is it used to engage with countries where there is more informality in terms of the relations with the EU, whereas is not as used in countries where the relation is more, let's say, established in a bilateral framework or multilateral framework with the EU and so on. And, and also on Libya, I, I wanted to ask which are the local partners actually, because the Utrecht, the Utrecht plan was established in 2015. In 2015, we still had a civil war in Libya and things right now are not um, very settled, let's, let's put it this way. So who are, who, who are the partners of the EU actually? So thank okay, you very right. much again for the presentation. Okay, very good. Thank you, Adria. Uh, yeah, Federica, if you would like to, we can take another question and then you sort of can group uh, and then you have a little bit more uh, time to think about things as well. So I have Federica uh, next. Hello, thank you. Um, great research, Federica. Uh, lovely to uh, hear and see about it. I have a couple of questions, um, mainly related to North Africa. Um, because uh, I have been looking into the actions that, that have been more directly linked to border management. So a, a partly different focus from yours, uh, but partly also overlapping. Uh, one of the issues that, that I have encountered, however, is the fact that, that not always, I mean, it's, it's extremely difficult to understand what these actions actually do at least in terms of border management, uh, because there is, you know, it can be anything from uh, upgrading the harbor in Tunis to, um, you know, drones surveilling the border, it could be really anything. And when I conducted a couple of interviews, it became even more difficult because it looked as if some NGOs or, you know, sort of uh, non-governmental actors were trying to keep up a more developmental agenda alongside the official goal of we must do border management and, in your case, migration. So I was wondering, how did you factor that in in your research? And the second question goes back to the issue of North Africa that you mentioned uh, at the uh, start, um, which seems uh, to be very uh, centered on uh, uh, the, the, uh, just the migration governance uh, aspect. However, uh, if I remember correctly, other um, sort of uh, uh, budget lines less linked to migration governance have been present in the case of North Africa. So, I mean, I suppose that, that they, I'm, I'm trying I haven't finished what I am doing, uh, so I'm happy to hear from you that this is the picture seen from the migration perspective, but I wonder to what extent uh, we can conclude that 
um, the southern neighborhood disappears in other forms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Federica. Uh, so back to Federica Sardo now, <laughs> if you would like to um, uh, answer those questions for us, and then we'll do another round of questions and comments. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for your uh, question, Adia and, and, and Federica. Um, so concerning the, the first um, point about uh, so Libya and uh, and the rest, <laughs> Libya and the rest. So uh, it's true that so Libya is definitely um, driving, um, uh, is in the driving seat when it comes to recipients of, of, of UTF. I mean, Utrust Fund is an emergency, uh, has been established and is conceptualized as an emergency mechanism. The, the interesting part of it is that it is, uh, it is uh, now affecting all the other uh, existing instruments beyond uh, emergency and crisis management instruments. So that's also the, the relevance of, of, of it. Um, I, I wouldn't say uh, necessarily that uh, it is covering those relationships where uh, there is a lack of formal, um, formal relationships uh, with, uh, with the European uh, Union, um, but it's true that it, it's covering part of, part of it. Um, there, as, as far as I understood from some, some interviews that I did at the beginning of, of the research, um, when, when the trust fund was, was launched, there was a huge discussion about how to, uh, so whether to create really the, how to, to, to create the North African uh, window. Even the fact that Libya was definitely the target of the of the Utrust Fund, uh, and and so the fact that the whole uh, it's it's important to see how also the very first debates, the very first discussion related to uh, North of Africa and the Trust Fund, even try to put uh, well crisis also where the crisis is not is not there. Uh, then of course it depends on uh, well our definition of crisis and at which level because all those countries in uh, North Africa are experiencing uh, different different kind of, of crisis. I'm thinking about the political crisis, the recent political crisis in Indonesia and so on and so forth. But uh, um, I think that 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 here um, there has been a, really an attempt to uh, try to cover all the countries, but uh, without. Uh, well, uh, without completely affecting the already existing relationships. So uh, the fact that with some, with, with the, all the other countries in the North Africa um, region, uh, well, there was already, especially with the signature of the mobility partnerships, an agenda uh, had to be combined with the trust fund to some uh, to some extent. Um, so yes and no to answer to answer your question. It's true that it's covering uh, an area where and a country where there is less formal relationships, um, but it's not it's not only it's not only that I'd rather say. And and concerning the 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 actors, so many of the act the local actors involved in the projects are um, so. You have uh, border guards uh, involved. Uh, you have some social infrastructure, so social uh, NGOs uh, working with um, working with uh, with migrants and, and refugees. With the case of with the case of Libya, uh, city servants. Um, but it's very hard, and that's a negative uh, point, which has well tells a lot about the lack of transparency to some extent with the, uh, regarding the, the actions funding under the trust fund to really identify the, role, the, the local partners uh, there because uh, not all the action fishes of the projects uh, mention the local partners. Um, it's really hard to contact uh, each project and to have the project document. So this has been a little bit of a struggle uh, to really identify them. But concerning Libya, definitely, so border, border guards, some civil servants uh, in, uh, working in the security sector, um, and local associations working uh, with, with migrants. So these are the actors um, involved. Um, concerning your questions, um, so Federica, so um, 
it's true that, that there are not only, uh, if I understood that correctly, so there are not only border management activities in, uh, in, in the north of Africa. Uh, and the thematic dimension migration management is, is big enough uh, to include many activities which are more development oriented. Um, but the fact that only that thematic dimension formally applies to the, to, to the geographic window limits the scope of, of the projects. So even when there is an, an attempt to, uh, to, 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 to draft, to design projects that are related to development and try also to support the local uh, agendas of some of, uh, some of the countries, um, what I felt when, when interviewing people was that uh, still the, the involvement under this thematic dimension um, constrains the, well, the delegations, but also the local partners uh, during the design of the, of the projects. Um, I, I would, so I did not totally argue that, that uh, Southern neighborhood is, is disappearing, but it's not, but rather that it's not clear what will be its position uh, in, in terms of relevance for the European Union in, in the future. So uh, one could say that there is an attempt to foster cooperation. So to, to look rather than to, to look rather at the southernmost neighborhood, to, so to rather consider the southern neighborhood as part of a bigger uh, of an, another ring. Uh, but at the same time, this would suggest that a lot of activities, cross-border, uh, cross-regional activities, should be in place in order for these regions to, to communicate, to to plan uh, common projects, and, and so on and so forth. And if I look at at the, the cross uh, cross window programs, this is not what is what is happening. Um, so the, what, I, what I saw is that it is unclear, it's, it's, it's difficult to really identify what's the new relevance, uh, what's the new position of the southern neighborhood for, for the European uh, Union in this, in this respect, given the, the expansion of the Sahel border from a, from a, as, a, well, as a representative geopolitical space, of course. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's what I wanted to uh, mention concerning both of, of, of the questions. Thank you very much, Federica. Let's uh, do another round of questions and comments. Uh, and I have Diego Varel first on my list. So, Diego? Well, thank you, Elizabeth. First, thank you, Federica, for presenting such an interesting research. And I'm diving into two of the things that you have mentioned. I will ask you first if you can delve a little bit more, if you have the kind of information concerning Spain and, and, and how it is really dealing with this trust fund for Africa, mostly taking into account the importance of, Mor of Morocco and all the other Sahel regions for Spain. And the second is concerning uh, the board of the EU trust fund for Africa, and not only about uh, the discrepancies between member states, but I am rather interested in knowing if you have identified in this kind of, or within the European Commission, tensions between DG Home or DG DEFCO concerning this external dimension and, 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 and who is really the relevant DG service, to say so. These are mostly my two main questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Diego, anyone else that would like to? ask a question or make a comment to Federica. All right, Federica, they are <laughs> eagerly awaiting that answer, I guess. Yeah, so um, thank you for, for the question. So concerning Spain, um, so this uh, also in the case of Spain, I mean, I don't have the map under my, my eyes now, but uh, it's definitely as well uh, consolidated. So all the projects managed by, by Spain or Spanish related uh, institutions, because the main implementing partners are in many cases are development agencies. Um, so in the case of Spain, uh, Spain is definitely taking care of the western uh, parts of the North African um, window. So it's, um, it's focused on, uh, on Morocco uh, mostly and a, a little bit um, on um, Libya and, and, and Tunisia, but the, the focus is definitely on the, on the north of, um, of Africa as well. So 
the, the trend is, is uh, close to, to what we see with, uh, with France, Italy uh, or, or Belgium, uh, with some countries clearly positioning themselves in those areas where they have their clear interests, their clear relations, uh, and rather leaving the others do the other, the rest of the job. Uh, that's, the, that's the interesting dynamics that I see here. Um, and that, that should be observed. Um, concerning the um, so the second uh, sorry the second uh, the second question um, was about uh, can you remind me sorry I just uh, just a second uh, Diego yes it's from the external dimension if the external dimension sorry yeah and the, the institutional actors sorry uh, correct so um, so the the trust fund has uh, at, at, uh, at the European Commission level, uh, so-called new trust fund managers uh, who uh, manage basically the, 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 the projects and the process. Um, and they are normally associated to the um, region. So you have one trust fund uh, manager uh, in DG Near uh, for, um, for the north of Africa and you have a uh, trust fund manager under the, um, the former uh, the Directorate General for Development Cooperation, so now it's MTPI, um, but uh, so now Directorate General for International Partnerships and, and Development, if it's uh, the correct name. Um, so they normally are located within, uh, within those Directorate Generals. Uh, but there is a very strong coordination by DG Home in this in, in this respect. Um, so I did not see a strong uh, level of, of uh, conflict compared to uh, to the past and to other cases um, when it comes to migration. Here, I think that there has been a division of, of competencies uh, before the launch or at the very beginning of the of the of the trust fund itself to settle really the competencies and, and clearly identify who's doing who's doing what in this respect. So, uh, for example, when when analyzing in the past in, uh, the, the the neighborhood instrument, um, I see far more conflict when it comes comes to the, the topic of migration with, of course, DG Ohm trying to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to be involved much more in uh, neighborhood related uh, activities uh, and so it, with a more conflictual positioning vis-a-vis um, -vis DG uh, Near or um, also in other cases, but my focus was on the neighborhood for sure. While here when, when interviewing, uh, there was a, well, I had a, some, some, some answers confirmed to, to me a feeling that there is a quite clear division of, of labor in this respect with a coordination, clear coordination role by DG Ohm and no big conflict or at least not uh, visible to, to a researcher's eye or to my eyes uh, after my questions at the, at the level of the regional, uh, let's say, uh, directorate generals. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments for Federica? All right, then I guess it's my turn, right? Um, so uh, to follow up really on what you just answered, which is super interesting if we think about um, migration policy as being in a broader umbrella of EU external relations and the war foreign policy and whatnot that uh, most of us are very interested in. I mean, it's it's never happened in the past, I believe, um, for those who are long stern students of the um, European foreign policy, correct me, it's never happened that there's been a good division of labor. It, there's always been like this tension between either the member states of where are we going, what are we doing? So the French in the UK, they were also loggerheads in the past about what to do in Africa and who to engage with and, and what level and in what way, because then the financial instruments had to be divided up and whatnot because of UK's concerns and whatnot. Um, and, and also within the EU, institutions used to have these turf wars going on about who was doing what and when and with what money so it's absolutely you know i'm surprised by <laughs> by your finds which is wonderful i mean this is a case study of something where it's worked then 
because otherwise the, the tendency, the general tendency is that normally there's always, you know, upsets from people who are trying to, you know, um, derail uh, many of these cooperation projects. Is it then to ask you in order to get some kind of clear ideas for uh, how this could apply to uh, different uh, areas of research. Uh, is it because um, UK left and all of a sudden there's a Franco-German, Belgium kind of condominium of uh, joint interest and they have been able to then divide up the neighborhood in a way that's conducive to national interest? Or do you see, uh, and I almost expected Federica Bitti to ask, ask, <laughs> ask this, is this a case of Europeanization? So where we're seeing, you know, increased good cooperation between member states and or EU institution in, um, you know, the beneficial sort of, uh, you know, the gain for a, a particular aim that the EU foreign policy is trying to do. That would be my first question. So what, what would explain this success? To summarize up my comment in one. And then my second question has to do with, I think it's super interesting, the, the way you highlight how the sudden neighborhood is no longer so important. And you, you make the statement almost like a broad, um, in a broad way, uh, that it's not, you didn't say that it's not important, it's not so important, right? And that um, much of EU's attention is focused on Libya and or Sahel, right? Does that mean then that we are you know, through migration, we're actually seeing uh, flow out to other EU foreign policy areas, our other EU external action areas, because it seems to some of us that EU foreign policy, when it comes to the Mediterranean and further south, it, nowadays is mostly about migration anyway. Not much else is going on. I mean, there's a little bit on the security front, but not a whole lot. So I'm wondering if you want to sort of engage with this intellectual kind of you know, think outside of the box. What does this really mean for the EU foreign policy that we're focusing so, so much on migration now? So does that mean that we have become you know, one dimensional in our foreign policy? And then the fact that the sudden neighborhood is no longer so important that the, the way it used to be, it used to be a key priority for the EU foreign policy. And now you're telling me that Sahel is taking that role, maybe Libya, especially if we see more positive steps ahead on, on the process that's been started there in recent months. So it's interesting if you can help me speculate a little bit about the status or the state of European foreign policy, I would, I would very much appreciate that. That would be the second one. And, um, uh, and then just a very concrete question. It didn't become really clear from your article. Why is it that Sahel has become so prioritized? Is it because of because I mean, now compared to before, because it's always been a transit area. It's always been an area of some insecurity and some, you know, concerns. But you're saying, you're telling me that now it's more than ever. So why is the shift now? Yeah, so, um, yeah, thank you very much. Very, very interesting uh, comments and, 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 and questions. Um, so one possible answer to at least the first two uh, of your question to, to some extent together. Um, so of course the division of labor uh, and how this is uh, happening could be also uh, part of a, even another research because it's, uh, I mean, it's a finding that I partly explore, explore during the research but it was not the core of that. But so my, um, my, my speculation, my, my, my answer to that could be that I think that through the, the trust fund, uh, so and I would be happy to hear also your uh, comment on that, also the one from Federica before, uh, or any other uh, participant, um, I think that the fact that for the first time there is one single instrument uh, that directly tackles the external dimension um, of migration. Uh, has at least allowed central, so centralizing or at least clarifying um, 
the, the, the roles and the responsibilities. The, the, the fact that for, for long, migration was everywhere, but couldn't really be uh, traced easily, uh, led, so this, this, this yeah, uh, the presence of so many, so many funds, but not really a direct fund for uh, for migration, especially the external dimension, because the internal one, I mean, the, 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 the fund for, um, the, the, for asylum uh, and integration was uh, always there. Um, but in the external dimension, the fact that there was no clear uh, box that could keep together the main priorities and also help the connection with all the other uh, foreign policy sub areas, if we want to call them like that, uh, I think that it increased a lot the level of conflict uh, between all the, the, the actors involved at the, at the level of the institutions and between the, the, the member states. Um, I think that this, well, I would speculate, I, I would uh, assume that this really played, uh, played a role. The fact of really creating one, uh, one single instrument where it is a little bit more clear that these are the competences of one specific actors and then of course there are three windows that refer to some specific directorate generals and so on and so forth, but still the box is there, the framework is there. Uh, because even with the launch of the, I mean, the mobility partnerships, for example, uh, this was still under the neighborhood policy, for example, with the, for, the, for the southern neighborhood. So there was a strong, uh, but, but then the management of that was clearly in the hands of the of DG Home uh, that really wanted to have a clear um, responsibility in the, in the management, um, but it was it was clear whether it was a new framework, how it could interact with uh, with the neighborhood, uh, even in terms of, of funding, for example. Um, while in this case, the creating for, for the first time this, this, this framework, I think, uh, at the instrument level, clarified a bit the picture. I wouldn't argue but uh, that it's related to Brexit and to the exit of, of the UK in this, in this respect, or not as far as I, um, as I understood that, that so far. Um, and um, yes, concerning the, and this also brings me to the second point, so is, this, uh, is, it, is it affecting also other dimensions of, of, uh, of the EU foreign policy? Um, for sure, but um, I, I, yeah, so migration is driving uh, EU foreign policy in some in some areas, especially in Africa or in the north of Africa, and then especially um, whether or not it will be the trust fund. And I I I, I would have hoped to see an instrument for external dimension of migration under the current uh, multi-annual financial framework under the EU budget, not as an emergency mechanism. This would have been a way to avoid that again migration goes into many other directions without clearly identifying uh, the, the, the interaction and the hierarchy in this, in this respect. Uh, but um, I, I, I think that at least the process clarified a little bit, I mean the creation of the trust fund to some extent clarified uh, a bit the interaction between development and, and migration, security and migration. So this is something, something um, positive. It, it opened and closed to some extent a box, and this is a positive uh, impact that I see. Um, the fact that there is not, not now is not clear what the future will be, uh, especially within the EU budget, uh, is well uh, worries me a bit because it risks being a step back uh, in, the, in the in the previous <laughs> situation. But um, yeah, I want to just observe, <laughs> observe, and observe that. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, that, that's my comment for for the, for the moment. Sorry, did you want to say something about Sahel that's more important now than? Oh, sorry, to... sorry. Yes, you're right. Concerning Sahel. Um, well, I think that all the discourse uh, about uh, the debate about the root causes and tracing the migration routes has brought migration definitely central. Uh, so as, as moved uh, Sahel 
clearly in the center of, of, new of new migration policies. It was already there, but it was more related to, so it was clearly a security, uh, an, a, an area where security had to be taken into account, whose security had to be taken into account. Um, I think that now, uh, with the that with the trust fund and with the fo well, that with the focus on following uh, and addressing the root causes, um, the uh, the addressing Sahel only not only from a security perspective, which was the core focus of, of the of the past. I think that increased its its centrality. That's that's how it came so strong uh, so strong in the in the EU agenda. I I believe uh, this is also something that when we, we look at the, at the two maps that I, I show is clear is pretty clear because in two thousand in two thousand eleven the 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 Sahel as a Depicted by the Sahel strategy is uh, is the secure is a security strategy and is a small area. When it comes to Sahel as a as a as a source of migration, then different countries, different networks uh, have have to be taken into account, uh, and so the borders are expanding because of because of that. So that's that's uh, going beyond the security issue has been one of the reasons why I, I believe it came back to uh, into the picture. That sounds like very, very plausible. So I'm, I'm perfectly with you. No problem with that at all. Uh, very interesting uh, remarks and, and, and explanations that you've given us. Um, I open the floor to anyone else who had a uh, last minute comment or question that they would like to make at this point. Otherwise, I thank you all very much for coming and for uh, attending this um, presentation. And uh, thank you very much, Federica, for also um, participating, for presenting your very interesting research. We wish you the, all the best of luck uh, with your, all your future projects as you're um, working on them. All right, bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, <laughs> bye.